Hi, I'm Ken Howard and welcome to the Gay Therapy LA podcast. Today, I want to talk about gay men coping with ED, erectile dysfunction, the emotional, physical, and interpersonal. I've had the pleasure lately of many gay men seeking out sex therapy or life coaching services who are seeking to improve the quality of their life by way of improving the quality of their sex life. And they improve the quality of their sex life by way of addressing the most common issue I hear about, which is erectile dysfunction, ED. However, not all of them cure their ED. You know, the answer, if there is one, and there is more than one, is learning to cope with it by way of coming to understand it from multiple points of view. So in my sessions with clients, I've noticed I'm usually responding to their concerns or complaints about ED in one of several large categories, the emotional, the physical, and the interpersonal. I would add to this uh, the cultural as well, such as their nationality, ethnicity, and certainly the religion they were raised with. Another huge factor is how their being gay was responded to in their family of origin, in their personal history, which I assess in the first couple of sessions. So who am I? <laughs> For those of you who are new to the podcast show, I am Ken Howard. I'm LCSWCST, a licensed clinical social worker in the state of California in the United States, and an ASECT, the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, a sect, certified sex therapist. And I have over 29 years of experience as a gay men's specialist psychotherapist, as well as life, career, relationship, and executive coach. I keep busy. Uh, I'm also a former adjunct associate professor of social work at USC, the University of Southern California, teaching psychotherapy theory, couples therapy, and an LGBT social work course. I've also been an expert witness on LGBT and HIV issues. I started my career in HIV, mental health, and social services. I'm also a novelist and a composer and lyricist of a musical play that I do on the weekends. So my perspective in helping gay men with ED comes from many years working with gay men's mental health, well-being, and sexuality. I work with individuals, couples, polyamorous polycules, originally at the height of the AIDS crisis, because as I say, I'm just old. I was around then. <laughs> and then in private practice in Los Angeles and West Hollywood, California. Later, I branched out to provide life, career, relationship, and executive coaching for guys all over the USA and all over the world. So I've heard a lot of concerns, let's say, that affect gay men's subjective quality of life by way of their sexual expression. And I help them in ways that point up the six principles of sexual health by Doug Braun Harvey and Michael Vigorito. And I have a previous podcast episode on the six principles of sexual health as applied to gay men. So I take Braun Harvey and Vigorito's ideas from their book, Treating Out of Control Sexual Behavior. Excellent book. And they discuss these principles of sexual health, and then I take it a step further and apply it to gay men. So it is with that perspective that I share these larger categories for thinking of the multifactorial contributions to ED and of course how to address them. So let's look at each of those three influences, the emotional, the physical, and the interpersonal, each in its own turn. So let's talk about multi-systemic contributors to ED. One of the many challenges about ED is that I really don't think it has any one cause. You know, usually that's the case. But just as certain injuries that someone might have affect different parts of the body, arriving at a state of less than satisfying or less than functional erections in sex can be influenced by different factors and by varying degrees of impact for each one. So reversing their impact or coping with them 
means parsing out the different influences and developing adaptive coping strategies for each one. So let's start with the emotional. When a guy isn't feeling his best emotionally, it can manifest by way of his penis. The classic one we can all guess is probably depression, because depression can have a big impact on reducing your sexual quality of life. You know, you're just not that into it. Uh, just like you might have a loss of pleasure, what we call in depression treatment anhedonia, the absence of hedonism, anhedonia, in other interest in life, and that happens, you know, as a clinical, as a as a symptom of clinical depression. Or let's also look at the emotional state of anxiety. Many guys report that they get in their head with anxiety about performing sexually, as if sex was a command performance for which they were being watched and evaluated with either a reward or a punishment as a result. Anger can be another factor in that it can be difficult to become aroused and erect for a partner that you're angry, frustrated, or resentful with. Stressed out is also a classic emotional state that will undermine erectile functioning, such as a busy job, an unsafe or unhappy living environment, facing financial pressures, losing your job, being abused by a partner or a boss or a co-worker, or reacting to a more global stressor, such as an economic recession or the COVID-19 pandemic. Irrational fears or phobias, such as a fear of HIV or other sexually transmitted infection contagion, you know, beyond what's reasonable, beyond, you know, sexual health. Um, that can also be in the mix. So, because phobias and fears are really uh, under the anxiety umbrella. When we consider the emotional influences that contribute to ED, ask yourself if any of these emotional states ring true for you, or maybe more than one, and in what proportions. Then, try to identify and implement the cognitive and behavioral adaptive coping measures to reduce the influence of each use. When we face a stressor, when we face a problem, we always want to look at what are our resources. An internal resource might be a commitment to addressing the issue, or it might be the courage or the stamina to see it through. An external resource might be something that you reach out for, a book, a website, consulting a professional, and coping measures are about not necessarily eliminating the thing that's challenging you, but learning how to adapt and respond to it so that whatever that stressor is has less impact on you and your quality of life. But in these examples, uh, depression might need treatment from a therapist or an antidepressant medication that you'd get from a psychiatrist, a type of M MD, medical doctor. Anxiety might need cognitive behavioral therapy for addressing the source of the anxiety, such as catastrophizing thoughts, and a cognitive behavioral therapist could help you identify what those are and help you to kind of take the sting out of them by offering you alternative ways of thinking. Mindfulness meditation practice, uh, increased self-care such as sleep, exercise, diet, and, and nutrition, recreation, and again, perhaps medication, those can also help. Anger or resentment might need couples therapy to air the grievances, work through them, and then collaborate on creative solutions together with you and your partner or partners. Stress management and burnout prevention can involve making changes at work, seeking a new job, or balancing work habits with your personal life. Stress that comes from the environment, like an unsafe or an uncomfortable home, might need to be addressed by moving. Abuse recovery is its own topic in therapy to set limits and put some distance between you and the offender. Irrational fears, phobias, uh, symptoms like an obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, might need therapy and, at times, medication. Fears of HIV or STIs might need safer sex or harm reduction counseling 
from a knowledgeable therapist, and you'd be surprised how many therapists are not knowledgeable about HIV or STIs or gay men's cultural issues. Um, HIV and STI prevention can also be something your doctor might do, or a physician's assistant, or a nurse at some type of gay affirmative medical clinic or, or medical private practice. And in some countries, the National Health Services might have uh, safer sex information and counseling, too. In other words, you know, if something is of an emotional disturbance is affecting not only your subjective mood, but also your functioning by way of erectile dysfunction, you have to address the underlying emotional state first or simultaneously with other measures. Now let's look at the physical. The physical contributors to ED are where this problem becomes especially collaborative between the client and patient and the therapist and the physician, the MD, who might be a urologist by specialty, he might or she might be an endocrinologist, even a general practitioner might be involved. Things like venal leakage, uh, which is issues about blood flow to the penis around the pelvic area, pelvic floor muscular issues or tightness that might require pelvic floor physical therapy from a specialized pelvic floor physical therapist, challenges related to your blood pressure, hypertension, the influence of other diseases or conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, etc., medication side effects, uh, prostate issues, including post-prostatectomy. If, if you've had your prostate removed from prostate cancer, that's a common cause of erectile dysfunction. And even orthopedic issues like muscle and bone flexibility and mobility um, and the ability to move your body in sex. You know, all of these would be under the purview of physicians of various specialties. And often the topic of ED requires multidisciplinary collaboration between a talk therapist and the physician working collaboratively to help the client or patient improve their sexual functioning in a multi-systemic way. So it might take more than one professional to help you with this. Coping with the physical influences of ED involves clinical assessment, the diagnosis, and treatment interventions specific to what's found in the assessment, which are ideas that could apply to the therapist, a therapist would do that, and to the physician. You know, they both would follow that assessment diagnosis and treatment plan model for helping their patient. Where the psychological versus the physiological begin and end can be challenging, which is why it's best for the patient's therapist and physician to consult with one another to assess what they see in their patient. They kind of talk behind your back and, and uh, give ideas to one another about what they're seeing in their assessment, what they're observing in you, and what they think the contributors to your ED might be, and of course what to do about them. Now let's look at the interpersonal. So similar to what was mentioned above about anger, you know, ED related to conscious or unconscious anger at a partner and other just interpersonal relationship factors can contribute to ED. I've worked with gay widowers who experience ED after the death of their partner or spouse because on an unconscious level they were prevented from having sex with a new partner because it felt like cheating on a partner who was deceased. Other guys have reported erectile dysfunction as a result of feeling like they were betraying their parents or their the clergy of their religious upbringing by having gay sex in the first place. Other guys can feel interpersonal pressure because they see their sexual activity in the context of trying to compete with gay male peers and they're kind of stud bravado stories that sound like you know straight guys in a locker room. Let's also look at the cultural. So similar to the feelings of guilt that a guy is betraying his parents or clergy, other cultural issues can place pressure on the man's sexual functioning. These can include expectations of men 
to or not to perform intercourse and under what circumstances. Gay men endure so much cultural pressure, you know, usually of the religious conservative kind, but other cultural pressures might be expectations of what real men must or must not do. You know, we might be pressured to be virile and use that penis that you've been given, but only in the heterosexual and procreative sense. When we are told that we must, but also that we must not, by our culture in different sexual ways, you know, that can be a stalemate where the penis just kind of gives up the ghost, you know. Even the pressure on gay men to be seen as virile tops is a sort of within gay culture pressure. You know, the pressure on bottoms to become erect and even ejaculate from anal and prostate stimulation from their top is also present. And some guys can do that as bottoms and some can't, but that's an ED pressure even on gay male bottoms. Meanwhile, the top is judged by his ability to bring his bottom to orgasm just from the size and speed and angle and pacing and technique of his own erectile functioning. So there are pressures everywhere, straight and gay, tops and bottoms, and then we wonder why ED is so prevalent in our society and in our world. In addition to any coping that we might do with these emotional, physical, interpersonal, or cultural contributing factors, we must also challenge the prevailing ideas socially about what sex is. Now, we're all conditioned to view sex as legitimate only if it's about penis in orifice to simultaneous orgasm model. And sex is so much more than this. You know, even in the most fleeting of hookups or tricks or one night stands, there's the role of foreplay and kissing and erotic touch or using toys or bondage play, sensual objects or materials, sexy talk, massage, licking, wrestling, impact play, role playing, and so much more, you know, than these perfectly legit sexual experiences that may or may not involve penile functioning, but they can still be fun and intimate and rewarding and satisfying and even loving. So perhaps beyond Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, Trimix, cock rings, whatever, our best tool for addressing ED simply starts with exploration of the consideration of all these different disparate factors and then applying lots of critical thinking to find what a rewarding sexual experience is for each of us. So if you'd like support for your own sexual identity, expression, or troubleshooting as a single guy or a gay man in a relationship, please consider therapy if you're a resident of California where I'm licensed, or coaching if you're anywhere else. And there's areas of overlaps, but I can explain the difference between therapy and coaching if you're interested in that. You can always email me at ken at gaytherapyla.com or call me or text me uh, at area code 310-339-5778. So in the U.S., it's I think it's 01 for the U.S., right? Uh, then the area code 310 339 Seven, eight for more information or to book an appointment for help with this or just about anything going on that affects gay men's mental health and well-being. So if you have ideas for future podcast episodes, please feel free to get in touch. Share this if you can with other gay men that you know that might enjoy hearing the episodes. And visit my website, gaytherapyla.com, for the archived blog articles and for other information on services. So thanks, and I'll see you next time.